I'm Megs and welcome to the Free to Be You podcast. I'm a life alignment coach passionate about helping women uncover who they really are so they can author a life they're obsessed with and move away from self-abandonment into full self-expression. This podcast is created with one purpose, to give you permission to finally free yourself up and be you in every area of your life. We discuss everything from mindset, health and vulnerability to relationships, parenting and more. My host today is not only a dear friend of mine, whom I have personally worked with, Emma Walkinshaw is a transformational coach, yoga instructor, and a leading expert in inspired action. She's also a wife and a mother of two grown-up children. And with her 21 Minutes of Morning Magic membership and Clarity Catalyst program, fosters intention, positivity, and direction for her members. As founder and host of Whole Heart Retreat, she also creates transformative experiences for professional women, encouraging inner wisdom and inspired action. We had a heartwarming chat about what it's like to be a boy mum and the grief we feel when they get older and no longer need us in the same way and how the amazing work that we do has helped us take that inspired action towards creating something new on the other side. Em, welcome to the Free to Be You podcast. It's so good to have you today. I know that we go way back and we already love each other dearly as friends, of course. Uh, but it's so good to have you bring your wisdom to my show. So thank you for being here today. Oh, thanks, Meg. It's an absolute pleasure and honour. Um, so good to connect and, yeah, cannot wait to um, discuss all the beautiful things we're going to discuss today. Cannot yes. wait. Yes. Well, before we do that, I'd really love it if you could share with us a little bit about you, uh, because I know that you have older children like me, and we have a lot of similar things in common. Um, But but yeah, a little bit about you and what you're doing now, and uh, then we can dive into our juicy topic that we have planned for today. Yes. Thanks, Meg. So I'm Emma Walkinshaw and I'm a transformational coach and just like Meg, a former hairdresser. And I always laugh and say that's really where we learn to be life coaches, even though we've gone on and done study and, and you know, learned the craft. <laughs> but I often bring it back to the roots of being a hairdresser and learning about people and becoming a really good listener and asking great questions. So I, I I attribute my beautiful skills as a coach to really back in, you know, being 16 in a hair salon. So that was, you know, my beginning pre-coach. I was a hairdresser and then worked uh, looking after long-term unemployed people and training um, certificates in retail and business. And then went into business with my husband. And by then I was a life coach. And then from then that has been for the last eight, nine, no, it's not, it's 2013. I've I've lost track, 10 years. 10 years I've been coaching, running workshops. And as you know, Meg, the last almost four years until March, I just sold the yoga studio. So I'm also a yoga teacher as well. So transformational coach, yoga teacher. And I love to run a retreat. <laughs> so I'm also a retreat host. And um, we'll share a little bit later on in the podcast what my next retreat coming up is. It's a very, very exciting one and something that's very dear to my heart. And I, I feel incredibly proud about this next retreat. So, yeah, that's what I do. So I spend mostly my days, I run a membership program called Morning Magic, which, as we all know, how hard it is to get a morning practice where you meditate, you journal and do a little bit of yoga. So that all happens in 21 minutes. So hence seven minutes of yoga, seven minutes of meditation, seven minutes of journaling, because there is not a woman that I come across that doesn't say, gee, I'd love to have a morning practice, but how difficult is it to actually stick to it? So I am the spiritual jogging partner. So that's one part of what I do. <laughs> of course, I run <laughs> I run the Clarity Catalyst. And uh, Meg and I, you came through the Clarity Catalyst with me years ago. And that was where, yeah. like you say, our true love started for one another as wise women coming together. So that's a transformational workshop that I run online now. And for a time there with the yoga studio, I was running it face-to-face. And then, of course, the world changed. Things changed in a wonderful way. So it has definitely gone online now. So reaching a lot more women, which is wonderful. And then I do one-on-one coaching. So that's what I do these days. So in a nutshell, 21 Minutes of Morning Magic, the spiritual jogging partner. I do one-on-one coaching. I run the Clarity Catalyst and retreats. So that's Hey, you forgot one very important hat. You're also a mum. 
<laughs> yes, I am a mum. I don't know how you wife. fit all of that in. How do we fit it all in, honestly? So it's so true. And it is true what you say about not re- like we feel like we don't have time to do the things that we want to do as as mum, busy mums and business women, but we have to make the time. So I love that you've got a, a, uh, a practice and something that we can, uh, a pathway, a framework we can step into with that. So that's really cool. So, yes, so, so the, the other job, the mum, as we know, Meg, you and I have had um, a discussion recently about this new evolution of motherhood. You know, my children, you know, I know that you've got a daughter still a little bit younger at school, but, you know, Sunny's 19 and Ruby's 21 and I'm just in a new phase. And and my marriage is in a new phase, a wonderful new phase, but it's a new <laughs> phase. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's that being able to kind of go through these stages and, you know, we chatted quite a bit about, you know, look, I can only speak from my own experience and, you know, from what I'm read. And I know this isn't everybody's journey, but this has been mine. And that Sunny and I have gone through and Mia Free, Free is it Freeman or Friedman speaks about this, like the breakup with your son. And I totally feel like that, you know, happened. And the, the whole process that Sunny and I went through. And, you know, Sunny's now 19, but it started probably around that 14, 15, where he started to really go towards Brendan, my husband, which is a wonderful thing. But the grief in that, oh, goodness yes. gracious, like the grief. And, you know, and there was kind of like a few pivotal moments, that transition, you know, I could probably, you know, feel Sunny, um, you know, starting to to go his own way and pull away from me somewhat. But then Brennan and Sunny had a beautiful boys trip to Japan together, which was beautiful. But then when Sunny came back, it was like, like, who, who are you? And, you know, the shift from mum to Emma, it's just now Emma. And it's like, oh, my oh. gosh. Ouch. I think I would cry if my kids called me Megs, although, you know, it might happen. Maybe they'll listen to this. They'll be like, that's it, mum. <laughs> it's okay for Emma. It's okay for you. And I remember a psychologist actually saying, you know, even that, you know, moving from mum to Emma, the psychologist saying to me, so I seen a psychologist, which was you know, incredibly helpful. And, and he said to me, you know, Emma, what's happening is you're moving from a mother, son, relationship to an adult adult relationship I was like oh gosh yeah the transition has to happen doesn't it at some point and funnily enough talking about that transition Sunny happened to be shopping with my mother and I at Christmas time so there was Ruby Sunny and I and my mum shopping anyway I wanted something at the shop so my mum said oh you can wait till Christmas and I said I want it and Sunny turned to me and said Emma can you stop acting like a teenager and I burst out laughing because <laughs> you know, we work with people all the time that go, you know, notice your patterns. Where are you being triggered? I'm like, oh my goodness, I am full blown in teenage mum thing with my mum at Christmas time at the shops. And my boy points out to me, Emma, you're acting like a teenager. Oh, <laughs> so funny. Yeah. So they, they, they are that. our teachers. Totally. I love that you've embraced it though and that you've just kind of have that that acceptance, but I bet it didn't come with a heck of a lot of grief, like you said. And I know that when my, uh, when I've got two boys, 21 in October, still blows my mind, and 19 as well. And when they were starting to, yeah, it was around that 14, 15, but when they started getting older and they didn't need me and in particular like Levi, the younger one needed me a lot more than Riley when he was growing up. So I noticed that um, void a lot more with him because he didn't need that level of care anymore. But when they both got older, especially when they got their license and they could just make their own decisions and I had no longer had that ability to keep them safe, for want of a better word, oh, my gosh, like I really found that hard. I really found it hard to kind of let them go, trust that I'd done the best job I could possibly do and that they were going to make the best choices because, let's face it, (laughs) you're not there to, you know, guide those choices when they're out and about. I really found that hard. But I also found it hard when they would not necessarily choose me as the person they came to when they needed advice anymore because when they were little, they were mummy's boys. They were mummy's boys and I loved every second of it. I'm not going to lie. 
<laughs> I loved every second of it. So when I didn't have it anymore and I, I really had to start to uncover and try and figure out who I was without that, it's such a big part of our life. Yeah, I agree. And I do think nature, I was only just having a conversation with a dear friend who is a naturopath and Ayurvedic. That's, you know, her whole business around Ayurvedic. And I was saying to her, it's funny how I think nature also plays a role in this. So we've had these beautiful little children that I get that mummy's boy where they just adore you. They think you are the most beautiful thing. Everything you say, they just, you know, there's that need and, you know, as the kids have gotten and old for me, I've found myself at times getting a little bit irritated because, you know, the rooms are a mess, the kitchen's a mess and feeling really irritated. And I was saying to my girlfriend, gosh, this is like, I, I find myself getting a bit pissed off. Like, and, and I was always just loving on them and getting like, oh my God, I'm so irritated. And she said, well, from a nature nurture perspective like how we you know going through hormonal change I'm without a doubt perimenopausal and she was saying so of course your hormones are changing in your body which is natural because you've got to get to the stage where you're happy for your children to start to leave the nest and she was saying so hormones change so you haven't got as much as that nurturing hormone and then they irritate you which is a which is a normal thing and she said but what happens is when they're little because there's so much physical touch and serotonin released and that that bonding hormone you are happy to be totally in service like you're in service but then you're almost like getting fed through that that you know um connection but then as they're older like I I have to ask permission for a, a hug from Sonny like I have to go uh Sonny is it okay if we have a hug I need a hug right now and he'll either grant permission or not <laughs> so I I think that's why I get like a little bit irritated because when they're little year of service, but you're getting lots of like love and connection and care, older, you're still doing the same level of service it feels like, but without the, the you know, the kisses and the cuddles. So, so I think, true. think that, yeah, so that was a light bulb moment for me. I thought, goodness, and hormonally, clearly that's what needs to happen. And, and you know, I say, and I said this to you, Meg, thank goodness I still adore my husband and love him to bits because I can see how it must be incredibly challenging. And this is why I think we hear statistically that 20-odd-year marriages, you know, break down in this stage of life because children, you're not getting probably the affection and attention from them, but still acting, you know, in service of them, you know, making sure everything's sorted. And then if your relationship with your husband, potentially you've grown apart or, you know, there's a thousand reasons, isn't there? You know, that that's broken down that, you know, that must be a really, really tough time for a woman. I, I can only imagine, you know, I'm just going through the bit with the breakup with the son and Look, Rube's my daughter's pretty steady all the time. It's mainly the shift with being a boy's mum. And, you know, thankfully, Brenda and I, so this stage of life, you know, Brenda and I have embraced that. I mean, one, you know, we've got more money. I mean, no more school fees. Kids are sorted. <laughs> kids have got cars, you know, that, that stage of life. And then going, okay, now it's time for us. What would we like to do? So, you know, hence a trip to Europe in September for a month. You know, so it's it's that kind of stuff going, well, well what do we want to do? What, yeah. you know, what's it look like for me? Yeah. So oh. that's, yeah, that's the other part of it. Oh, my gosh, there's so much in there. Let me think where I want to jump in. Oh, I want to jump back into what you said. Let's actually start at the beginning. Yes, they pull away and we get triggered by that mess. But I, you're, I feel like, listening to you, that has to happen so that we can let them go. Because mm. we're like, you take your mess <laughs> And take it somewhere else and come visit me. I'll make you dinner. That's kind of where I'm at right now. Like, I love you. <laughs> I love you. But maybe that's a part of it. It's a part of it is like yeah. that breaking up. So there's that. And I really have felt that. And my oldest one is about to move out this weekend. And it, I'm, I'm struggling with this letting him go because he actually does still come give me a hug every night. He hugs me when he gets home from work and he hugs me when he, he's still very affectionate. I love that about him and I, I like to say that he gets that from me because I'm super cuddly. Uh, but I love that he still does that and I know that that will possibly maybe end one day. So I'm not looking forward to that at all, but it's okay. There is that stage where they stop cuddling you in front of their friends when they're younger. So we kind of get a taste of it, but yeah, I'm still getting my hugs before bed, so that's okay. But then you're right about... <laughs> about your 
relationship with your son changing and being around this time of life where if you're not 100% on the same path and have grown in the right direction with your partner, that that could be make that particular part of your journey even more challenging because you're going through both of them at the same time. Definitely my experience in a different way but similar because it will that all happened for me around the same time. I think that you the easiest way to navigate it is to focus on you. Like to look within mm. and really start to rediscover who you are without that relationship with your son, with your sons in my case. So when your children get older, there's this void where they don't need the same level of care and they don't need the, the they don't even necessarily want the same level of connection. Um, this is all subconscious, right? So then we're left with this, and even if they haven't left home yet, we're still left with this void that we're used to having filled with them. So the, yeah. the way to navigate that that I have found, and I know you and I have talked about this already, is to turn and look in the mirror, look at yourself and rediscover who you are now without that. For me, that also included my marriage, rediscovering a whole new side of myself without the identity that I had before as a mother, as a wife, as a, you know, the business I had at the time is a massive, massive shift. That's why I have this podcast and why I'm doing what I'm doing. But on the other side of that, I now look back and see that the only way through that is to actually go on that journey of rediscovery, that self-discovery journey. Mm. I, I agree. And keeping, you know, and I think that's one thing that I feel incredibly grateful for in my marriage is Brenda and I, as much as we are very connected, we're in business together. You know, I'm still part of Brendan's town planning firm here on the Gold Coast. Um, but I love the fact that we've still maintained to have our own independence. And even back to, you know, me running retreats, you know, I'm I'm hosting retreats and, and I've kind of got to the point I say to Brendan and even, you know, Brendan and Sonny going to Japan, that was for the Rugby World Cup when they did that trip. And I said to Brendan, how I how I see us, you know, growing old together is you and I have a trip together. We when the kids are ready to come back and want to come for a trip with us, we'll do it because you know it's been probably two years since they've wanted to come with us. We do a trip with the kids because you know, eventually they'll have, you know, a family of their own eventually. And we'll do like a family trip. And then I do some stuff that I want to do and Brendan does. Hence, you know, this you know, next retreat is in India. Brendan has no desire to go to India at all, but I do and all my women do and, you know, the group of women that are coming with us, there is still, of course, some spots available, but the women that are all coming and some of them married, some aren't, but I I feel for me the key was to stay independent within my marriage, to stay independent as my role as a mother because then that, that makes everyone happy, well, particularly me happy. Because, Which know, is the most important am. thing. Absolutely. Because yeah. yeah. otherwise then you're hanging your happiness on someone else and unless they act this way or do this or be this, I can't be happy. Whereas if you just take the happiness into your own hands and and that's not easy though, being a mother, then discovering what actually is it that I want to do, what lights me up and, and that doesn't come overnight. That takes a little bit of reflection. Well, not a little bit, a lot what? of reflection. Yeah. And that's yeah. the work, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I remember when I was going through what I just shared, I met you around that time. And I came and did the creative insight journey as it was called at the time, which was really an opportunity to dig into that part of our brain and take that inspired action towards something that actually does bring out that creative beautiful self-expressed version of ourselves uh and that was I you remember how much I struggled in that that was a what was it eight weeks eight weeks yeah yeah I really struggled. even though I was already a coach and I was already in this space but not quite as deep as I am now but going into that eight week program with you and and having to myself out there and do things that were outside of my comfort zone in front of other women who were all doing the same thing so we were all doing it together and I remember the final night where we had to dress up and (laughs) that was just so much fun and the transformation from the first week to that week for all of us was 
phenomenal. But it was just the start because once you're out there and you've freed it up, then you actually have to learn how to be it. Are you sick of that inner critic? You know, that inner mean girl that sits on your shoulder waiting for you to screw up, waiting for you to compare yourself to other people and tell you that you're not good enough. I know exactly how you feel. And I have created a quiz for you to uncover what lies she has you believing and give her a name so that you can free yourself from that story for good. In the bottom of the show notes here, you'll find a link to go and take the quiz. Once you get through the quiz, we are going to give your inner mean girl a name. And from now on, you're going to refer to her as this alter ego that is not who you really are. So once you've done listening to this amazing show, head over to the show notes, take the quiz. And if you feel called, let me know in the notes of the post that you found this podcast on what your inner mean girl's name is. It's one thing to uncover it and bring it up and flesh it out, but to actually then put that into play and and learn how to be that in the world, you're showing up a completely different human being. And some people are going to like that and some people are not going to like that. And that was my experience. And so there were some sad, really painful goodbyes along the way from people that I thought would be in my life forever, not just not just my marriage, but a number of people. And so I had to mourn those on top of mourning what we just started with, which is the, the, the parent-child relationship or the mother-child relationship, more the point. Thank goodness I still had my beautiful Grace, who is only 11, <laughs> and she is me. She is me, Meg's 2.0, but better. Um, so I still have this beautiful, you know, you know, smaller version of me, but she is somebody in my life who makes me be the best version. She makes me step into, uh, being more self-expressed and showing up in a way that's powerful and strong and move moving forward. And so it's good to have that little person behind you or, you know, anybody really, but when you have someone who's literally a replica of yourself moving up behind you makes you kind of kicks you in the butt and makes you be the best version and do the work what a gift though like that you know there are no accidents you know what children bring to you is, is yeah is so yeah if you can if you can settle into it and not resist it and embrace it that's where the that's where the gold is yeah because I often think that I'm the parent of Ruby and Sunny but am I (laughs) <laughs> exactly <laughs> they are the biggest teachers that is for sure that is for sure yeah, but yeah that yeah. that whole start of that process is it's difficult to step into it and I know that for a lot of um the people listening a lot of the women listening they may or may not have already stepped into that journey in terms of yeah. taking themselves on and freeing themselves up some of it's terrifying because if you you, it's a fear of the unknown. You don't know what's going to be on the other side. But in order to have a transformation, we generally have to have a breakthrough. So what has your experience been with that, with, with your clients, so taking them through that breakthrough in order to have that transformation on the other side? I think, you know, the breakthrough looks different for everyone else and it's it's in layers, right? You know, if I think about, you know, the process, the transformation process of coaching or, you know, it specifically, you know, the Clarity Catalyst, you know, it's a specific little methodology that is softly, gently, I like to say, and, and Meg, I don't know if you remember this or, or had this same feeling, but I think the Clarity Catalyst or formerly known as the Creative Inside Journey, I feel like it's it's playing it light, yet it's deep. So there's this lightness to it that the concepts can be quite light, but but the work's quite deep. And and I think that's, you know, part of the, the transition or the transformation process is not to get too in your head about it, be somewhat light and easy with it and have a sense of humour about yourself, but really raise your self-awareness. You know, you can still be light, but really raise your self-awareness. You know, how do you show up in the world? Where are your perhaps blind spots or shortcomings? And are you willing to, to, to shift and to change? Or you can keep doing what you've always done. And what's the saying? Get what you've always got. Or you can actually be open to 
uncovering each layer and not resisting. Because when you do accept momentum builds, like look at you, the momentum decisions you made, Meg, momentum has built. Wow. You know, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, quite fast moving, really. I mean, you look back and go, oh, gosh, it's been, you know, had, you know three or four years, but no, but the momentum was fast. Yeah. Because when you kind of say yes and you start to, yeah, wake up maybe. I don't know if it's wake up. That's probably not the right word. But, yeah, that momentum. You start to Would step into it. Oh, 100%. Yeah, step into it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because what happens, as as you you know, as you know, because I know this is something you talk about as well, is you start to say yes to things and then the universe goes, okay, here you go. Here's some more of that then. And so you step into it and it just continues to compound and compound and compound. Uh, and I know that, you know, we have had some similar conversations or similar things happen to us in this particular space I'm talking about right now. But one of the things that uh, my partner, Luke, calls me the car park whisperer because everywhere we go, <laughs> I get a car park and it's usually within 10 paces of the door and it doesn't matter how busy it is or where we're going. It just happens. <laughs> it's just this expectation now. It's just not a, it's non-negotiable. It just happens. And so that yeah. didn't come from, that didn't just come from nothing. That come from me just having a new expectation and showing up in a way that's like, I deserve this. I deserve to have these things. I my the self awareness, but along with the self awareness comes this level of self confidence and self assurance yeah. that you actually deserve those things. Yeah, of course it will be there. That's exactly right. And in self awareness, you're able to own your gifts and talents and stop doing the things you're not good at. Like I love that's the biggest thing about raising my self awareness. I now know what I'm really good at and where I need to put my time and energy and I know what I'm not good at and I do not go there anymore. I don't push through it anymore. And it was kind of mm. like, you know, when they keep both of my children at school, I said to them both, you know, there are subjects where they'll, you know, struggling. When it came to those times where you're choosing subjects, I said, anything that you are not good at, drop it, just focus on what you're really good at. You know, Because I think that's how life should be. <laughs> yeah, well, if don't you're good at it, it's anything. probably because you like it as well. Yes. So just do what you're good at. So I kind of have spent a lot of my time now, and even in our business, I just outsource the things that I'm not good at. Mm. And someone gets it done way quicker, way more efficient and way more costly than if I were trying to do it. And and also that's just that self-awareness thing going, you know, back to the, you know, I'm, I'm worth it. I'm actually worth to choose to do the things that light me up and that I'm good at, particularly at this stage in life. Mm. I don't need to be, yeah pushing myself through that, which I know I'm not good at and I don't like. But it also yeah. steals you of your creativity. Oh, my goodness, well, doesn't it? A hundred percent. So I like with the podcast mm. right now, I'm doing all of it. It's only new. <laughs> well, I mean, a couple of months in now. So, you know, it's only, but there's been this massive, steep learning curve, but I've enjoyed it. I've actually enjoyed it because I love to learn. And so the creativity is still there, but the second it's not, I don't want this to become something that is a chore because I love it. So when I am in a position where I can have somebody come on board, I'm going to keep doing the parts of it that light me up and the parts that are, let's just say they're a bit of a ball egg, for giving those things away because I never want it to steal my creativity. So, yeah, I love yes. that. I love that that, that level, that self-awareness, brings up all the things that you're good at. It br- it moves you towards things that are going to light you up more. But you first have to yeah. say that you're enough and that you deserve it and that it's it's time to choose you. Yeah. And like you say, step into your creativity because that's, you know, we are creators, every single one of us, you know, and I love that question, you know, at the start of Creative Insight Journey, the Clarity Catalyst, I ask everyone that question, do you think you're creative? And it's funny, it's always a mixed bag. You know, usually half will say, half will say yes, half will say no. And the middle bit, there'll be a couple in the you know middle that say sometimes. And I love that question because in actual fact, every single one of us is creative. You don't have to dance, sing, paint or draw to be creative. You know, I look at my beautiful husband. He is a town planner and was a solicitor, but his creativity, when I look at his filing system, I go, you are so creative. I mean, people <laughs> look at my desktop and nearly, you know, 
have a meltdown. Like, like my girlfriend the other day came and said, is that your desktop? She said, I'm having anxiety looking at that. Like that's not the way my creativity works. I'm different. I'm different creativity. Whereas I look at Brendan who has a job that, or, you know, a business that's very legislation driven, yet he's still creative in that. You know, creativity isn't, we are creative all day, every day in so many different ways. So I think that's the other thing about self-awareness and coming into this stage of life and allowing yourself to reflect and really start to own your goodness. Because we've got through the part of life where we've had to do all the heavy lifting, which is cook, clean, raise kids. And we have had to put ourselves on the back burner, of mm-hmm. course. You know, you've chosen to have children, but once the kids are off on their li- with their license and doing their own thing, are you still putting yourself on the back burner and are you still being a martyr? Yes. Or are you saying, I'm a creative being, it's my time to shine, you know, oh, that's, that's yeah. so good. And that's, well, one of the things that I say all the time is we are the creators of our life. Well, I've sort of been saying we're the authors of our life. We write our own story every day with the choices that we make. So we are mm-hmm. in creation mode, whether we think we are or not. We are creating something that's either in alignment with who we are or not. So the whole point of us, you and I, even being here right now is to actually encourage people to realize that everything they need to create the things that they want is within them. And most Mm. of it, if you think about it, we're we're moms and we've got children, we're in our 40s, right? And Mm. our kids are older, they don't need us. But that's a whole half of our life that we've just spent investing in our families and whatever, but we've still invested in ourselves unknowingly. We've, there's a lot of wisdom and uniqueness in every single mother's journey with their children that if we actually sat down and, and rediscovered who you are now after that and because of that, more importantly, that you could actually then step into creating the second half of your life in this really beautiful self-aware way yeah and and you know what Meg when you were just talking and I was thinking about that when you were chatting I thought you know what it really is it's it's not even necessarily us um rediscovering or trying to figure out what the next half of our life is going to be it's actually remembering what you've put on pause or what you've actually put on the shelf because you were raising kids. If you were to reflect back and think, yeah, what are all those actual, what are those desires that I had when I was younger? What actually were those desires? I'm actually going to pull them out and dust them off. So sometimes Mm. it's not necessarily going, I have no idea what I'm going to do in this next time in my life. The kids have all grown up. Actually, just remember what you wanted to do, but you had to just pause for a little bit. Yeah, you know, we had and to that's rediscover it. Yeah. Yes. So it's this rediscovering and this uh, allowing yourself to to pause and rediscover because we yes. have this identity crisis, if you will, when we kid, when our kids don't need us because that's like that's who I am. That was my job. Like this is all I know. No, there's way more underneath all of that. It's just that, like you said, we put it on pause. We self-abandoned. Not in a bad way, right? We abandoned the things that we wanted. We abandoned the self that we were in our 20s before we were parents. And now we get to rediscover that. And now we get to self-express that in a whole new way. But along with that comes all the wisdom that we've gathered from being a parent. Because that is, yeah. it's a beautiful learning journey. Like we just said, our kids are our biggest teachers. 100% believe that. We learn so much. And so while we could sit in this grieving process forever and then this is my lot and this is my partner and I don't like any of it and become bitter and a martyr, or we can actually get really brave and vulnerable and actually turn and look at what is actually there and start to rediscover what is us and let go of what isn't. Yeah. And, and you're exactly right. That's the bit that just takes a bit of courage to actually step into, into that and it's exciting. And even, you know, the other thing, Meg, you know, I around that grieving process of Sunny, even, you know, through through the grief process, Sunny finishes school last year, I have had this new sense of freedom. When I'm booking retreats and booking things now, I, I'm not governed by school terms anymore. Oh my goodness. But you don't realize how much you're almost institutionalized. You know, the kids are at school for what the last, I don't know, 19 years, you know, Ruby and Sunny together, 19 years of the of terms I've done. 
and this freedom about I don't care when the school holidays are. It doesn't <laughs> matter anymore. Mm. But that freedom in that, you know, so there's many, yeah, through that grief process, there's many, many, yay, benefits. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That, and you don't even oh. realise how much you're locked in. Yeah, we don't realise how much we're locked in. That's true. I'm still locked in a little bit. But but I think that you don't realise that, but if you're not actually looking for that, you won't see it anyway. You'll just be stuck in the grief, right? Yes. And so that's the thing yep. is that having that self-awareness and being brave enough to step up, step up to the plate, get out of autopilot. Read yes. Just, you know, go on the journey. Yeah. Take yourself on. It's very, very exciting. And I know that, you know, we're both super passionate about that and we're both very, 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 very excited about the transformation that we've had ourselves, but that we now get to share with others. And I know you've mentioned uh, your retreat a couple of times as we've been chatting, which I know that's a big thing for you because, I mean, I remember when I first met you, you'd just come back from India. So I, I remember that excitement that you had around that. So before we wrap up, I'd really love it. Like, tell us a little bit about that. But before you do that, what do you think is the biggest takeaway that we would like people the person listening to get from this conversation what would you say would be the biggest thing out of everything we've said if that they could take away from this episode I think it's definitely around you know I think this discovery particularly the grief of children growing up and then what are those things that or, or tools or practices that we can do to help I guess open up that reinvention of ourselves I think we definitely have to slow down I think you've alluded that to that Meg we have to slow down and everyone slows down in a different way. If that merely means a walk without any headphones in, so you can hear your voice of wisdom. You know, when we're keeping ourselves busy all the time, you know, I, I say voice of wisdom or intuition, but your intuition, often it's just a whisper. So we have to slow down and get quiet to know our next step. And often our intuitional voice of wisdom only gives us a little crumb. It's never the whole, we want, we want the whole, give me the plan, but it's not. Usually it's one little step, but we've got to we've got to get quiet to hear that. And you know, for me, you know, yoga is a great thing. You know, I know you love to meditate and journal as well. Maybe that's your thing, but maybe it's just a walk with with no uh, other stimulation. Then I think it's you know finding things that help you get in your flow. That's another thing. So. You know, I know for some people, this isn't me, but some people love to cook. And that's maybe when they're in their flow. Again, it's like a moving meditation where you're concentrating or focusing on something, but you're in your flow because that's where the joy is because you're present. So getting really present and in your flow, I think is a good one. And then, you know, choosing things that grow you. And I feel that people that we surround ourselves with are so instrumental in our growth, our courage, and back to that intuition and voice of wisdom, you know, getting with the collective, I think, you know, there's a couple of parts, getting quiet yourself, but then also surrounding yourself with, you know, wise people or people that are really joyful and doing great things in the world that can be extremely inspiring. And that that's what I find for me is soul food, soul food. So, so yeah, good. so I hope, did I answer that? Yeah, I think those are great steps. They're great points. And yeah, it per- sums up perfectly what we talked about. So what what is happening with this, this retreat? I know it's India. I just let the cat out of the bag. Yeah. But tell us. Tell us more about it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So India is happening in March 2024. And we are taking a group of women over there. So I'm actually co-facilitating with Yogi Lu, who's a dear friend of mine. So when I had the yoga studio, we ran retreats just in Byron Bay. So uh, local ones and due to, you know, the state of the world with, you know, the world went bananas, as we know, and, and things were a little bit unstable. So kept them just in Australia. But now, and as you mentioned, I went to India myself in 2016. And almost like the moment I got back, I said, I am going back to India. So the time has come. So we've partnered with a great company because India is a country that you definitely need someone on the ground who, you know, dot the I's, cross the T's and, it, you know, for many reasons and purely safety and just making sure we're, we're all taken care of. So we are doing the Golden Triangle, which is a classic kind of India little journey into Delhi. And then we go to Rishikesh, which is the yoga capital. And there's a heap of ashrams there. 
and it's really beautiful. Like it's out of the hustle and bustle because Delhi's crazy town, but Rishikesh is quite beautiful. And the Holly Festival's on at the time where, you know, that beautiful, you'll see those visuals of the colour throwing, but that's to spark and celebrate the start of spring. So we'll be there. And that's kind of our retreat style. So Yogi Lou and I, I'll be delivering transformational workshops and yoga as will Yogi Louie. So the transformation, the magic of India, as well as we'll be doing some beautiful, um, I guess, provoking prodding and provoking while we're there to open ourselves up. We also go to Agra, which is the gorgeous Taj Mahal. Uh, and we're doing the sunrise. When you get to the Taj Mahal at sunrise, because it's uh, marble, you see all the beautiful different colours. It turns from pink into blue and all these gorgeous. And also the crowds aren't crazy then either. <laughs> uh, and then we are also doing Jaipur, which is the pink city. So the visuals in Jaipur are mind-blowing as well as their markets. So they've got spice markets and they have got gem markets and textiles. So that's the other bit. We do a cooking class there too. So it is oh my it is gosh, so just, much. Oh, so you know, exciting. So it's, it's 11 days, 10 nights, but um just exceptional. So absolutely delighted to be hosting that. And and as I do, like I'm already thinking of the next one, but I'm trying to just come back to the present moment. <laughs> and go Eat your own cookie. So, yeah. yes, I exactly. love that. I love that. But yes, well, I'm what's happening there. Yeah, cool. Well, I will put the um the link in the show notes here so people can find out more about that. And um, I love that you're getting to go back because, like I said, I remember how much you loved it last time. And um, you and I are going to do a few more things in the near future together. So that's very exciting. So we'll maybe have to have you back again at some point so we can talk about that because, yeah, I think you and I are so aligned and that's what this is all about. It's all about you uncovering who you are, figuring out what's most meaningful to you and then looking, well, aligning yourself, finding those things that you align with, finding those people that you align with so that you can start to move into a more self-expressed, just being you in the world. And you do need people around you like that. And you are definitely one of my people. So thank you for being on the show today. And as I always say at the end of my uh, my episodes, just remember that this is not a dress rehearsal. This is the main act. This is it. So it's time to be you it's time to be the real you and uncover all the things that make you the beautiful soul that you are thanks Nick. <laughs>